Okay, so uh, I, as part of this debate, I am going to argue, uh, no, you should never use third-line therapy. And uh, it's, uh, I feel very uh, guilty uh, being up here defending that, this, this aspect of the debate, because I've probably given more fifth-line chemotherapy than anybody I know. Um, and, and the reason is that, uh, that I, you know, it's like Medical Oncologist Anonymous. Uh, I'm a true believer uh, and totally invested that we got to keep trying, got to keep trying. There's value in the fight and, and this issue of uh, patients who just can't stand not taking something whether it's a natural remedy or a phase one trial. So uh, this is hard for me to argue, no, you should never use third line therapy, but I'll, I'll put the arguments up there. Um, so, so, you know, in the third line, except for erlotinib, you're off label, oh, you're working off of phase two data, no phase three data, and there's a long list of drugs uh, to choose from that you might give in this situation. Uh, and so, you know, maybe my best argument for no, you should never use it is that you really ought to put these folks on a phase one study. So no, you should never use any of this DREC. You should put them on a phase one study and try and learn something with the patient and make progress. But uh, these, all these drugs, um, uh, it, the, the drugs that accumulated uh, over the last 20 years are cytotoxic drugs, and now even the newer tyrosine kinase inhibitors have marginal efficacy and never made it in phase three. Um, the one thing I will say about cytotoxics versus targeted drugs is uh, mechanisms of resistance uh, to cytotoxics drugs tend to overlap. Um, if you're damaging DNA or preventing mitosis from a variety of different ways, there's a single downstream pathway that makes you resistant. Whereas if you have an oncogene and targeted therapy, you can overcome broad mechanisms of resistance. That's why something like erlotinib has such a great response rate even in heavily pretreated patients because they had that magical EGFR mutation. But basically all of these salvage drugs are not good enough. Re response rates of less than 10% and toxic uh, side effects. And if you look, uh, there's one study I found uh, looking at efficacy after second line. And this was a uh, retrospective uh, looking at 700 patient, patient charts at the MD Anderson Cancer Center published in uh, 2003. And these were all patients who made it to fourth line. So this is, this is a good population. You know, these are patients, if you make it to fourth line, you're, you're pretty sturdy and maybe responders respond, maybe these are the best patients you might want to give third line therapy. And when they actually looked at the numbers, uh, the yellow is overall response rate. You start getting into this you know, less than 5% range of response and no responses in the fourth line chart review. Okay, there's this issue of disease control rate where the patients are actually on this drug for more than two months, whether they just have slow growing disease or not. So essentially there's very little efficacy signal here. So you're really, um, you're going from a situation where in the first and second line where the treatment is statistically most likely to help and so you'll ask the patients to tolerate side effects and walk through fire to a situation where the treatment is most likely not going to help. And so you gotta be really careful of side effects. You gotta be really careful of cost in this situation. Um, and on now to why in this situation you shouldn't give a drug off the shelf. You should put them on a phase one trial. So uh, in terms of, this is old data online, but basically, and I think this is still true, only 5% of American cancer patients ever go on a clinical trial. And that is terrible, I think, because all of the progress we've made, we have now have 15 drugs for lung cancer, came out of these great trials. So we need to get more Americans to go on clinical trials. It's, a, it's, it's the way forward. Um, in surveys, 77% uh, of American cancer patients say that they would consider participation if someone bothered to ask them. And when informed about uh, a clinical trial by their doctor, when I actually pitched a trial, 40% uh, actually enrolled. So, you know, there's, the patients want to hear about these things. They want to be referred for these things. Um, and then once they went on the study, the majority, 96%, said they, you know, it wasn't, you know, they, they understood it. They, they get it. And, and they would want to participate, even if it didn't necessarily help them. So that's the the clinical trials pitch is ask your patients, refer your patients for phase one studies. 
And now for the cost as, a, as another issue. So ASCO came up with the top five ways to decrease cost in oncologic care, and the number one way that the ASCO experts said to decrease cost is don't use cancer-directed therapy for solid tumor patients with low performance status or no benefit from prior evidence no benefit from prior evidence-based interventions, the progressors, not eligible for a clinical trial, and no evidence supporting the value of further anti-cancer treatment. So when you're in a situation where the, where the drug is very unlikely to help, cost really matters, and be careful of cost in that situation. Um, on the flip side, so I'm a true believer. I want my patients to go on clinical trials. Um, be honest with your patients. And, and the stark truth is that your, the phase one drug is very unlikely to work. And you gotta tell them this when they're going, don't give them false hopes, just tell them you're, you're, we're going on an adventure together and we're trying this new thing. Uh, if you look at retrospective data of phase one clinical trial participation in non-small cell lung cancer, it's horrible. So this is CTEP data published in clinical lung cancer a few years ago, and you see that Kaplan-Meier goes straight down and the median treatment duration is only about two months. So chances are the phase one is not going to work, so don't fool yourself and don't fool your patients about putting them on these phase one studies, and yet be a true believer. So, uh, and this is, so I introduced you to a character earlier, Maintenance Monty Hall, M Maintenance Monty, switch maintenance, let's make a deal. I'm gonna introduce the, the person I try to be in phase one enrollment, and that's phase one Francis. He's the new pope. He's, he's the humble pope, okay? He's the humble pope. He took the bus to the Vatican, okay? And basically, he's a true believer, but he's very humble and, and, and is very careful not to uh, say more than he should about what he's doing in that role as pope and, and in our role as uh, medical oncologist. So try and be a phase one uh, Francis. And I, I, I also had one with uh, Sir Edmund Hillary. Uh, as an icon, but I thought that Francis would be more recognizable, so I'll stop there. That's great. Thank you so much.